So it used to be that my, my nightmare of standing up here in front of people would be following somebody who was absolutely fucking brilliant. It's, I have a new nightmare. It's standing on the stage after somebody who was absolutely fucking brilliant and who taught people how to be brilliant on stage. And then I have to stand up in front of you lot and talk. <laughs> so thanks, Jonas. I obviously understood almost nothing of it, but I got a bit of it. And one thing that Jonas said at the very beginning was, less me, more us. And I would suggest to you that if you work in teams, when you leave here today, if the only thing you remember is less me, more us, you will have taken an incredibly valuable lesson away. I have a variety of stories that I start my talks with. Um, but this is one I've never told anybody before because it only happened this week. On Tuesday, I was on a late shift in the emergency department and we got a trauma call coming through. The trauma call was 19-year-old male, RTC, um, motorcyclist. Helmet got lost when he was flying through the air. And the OBS are pulse 120, blood pressure unrecordable, respiratory rate 25, GCS 13, end tidal CO2 3.8. So we did what we do. We activated the massive hemorrhage protocol, we activated our trauma team and people came down and we got together and we had our pre-brief and our pre-brief was the usual pre-brief where we introduce ourselves, where we talk about what's coming in, we decide what we think is going to happen try and get some kind of shared mental model. And then we have a chat about telling each other things, making sure that nobody is starved of information, that it's our responsibility to talk to each other, particularly if the team don't think that I know something or if they think I'm screwing up. And because it was a massive hemorrhage protocol, Various people who aren't normally there turned up. So I got the trauma and orthopedic consultant. I got the uh, anesthetic consultant. And we were all in recess. Now, they weren't, those other consultants <coughs> are not part of my team. I have my core team. So guy comes in. We do transfer. We do all that stuff. We find pretty much what the pre-hospital guys have found. Found dull quiet, left-hand side of chest, but we have a blood pressure at this point with a systolic of about 110, and we think, okay, we are going to go through the scanner. Our scanner is five meters away from the trauma bed, so it's, it's less risky than other situations. We go through the scan. On the scout view, so the one when he's lying down, you see that the left-hand side of the chest looks a bit grayer than the right. And then we start to get some of the transverse views, the sections, and we discover that, yes, he has a hemothorax. So I say to the guys, let's get ready to put in a chest drain when we get back into recess. And I disappear. In fact, I leave to go and speak with the nurses to get the stuff set up. I do that. Then the guys come out, and we're setting up for the chest drain. Now, the chest drains in trauma attract quite a lot of attention. So we get the student nurse appearing because they don't get many chances to see that. We get a couple of junior doctors appearing because they want to be part of it. And this is all really good, worthwhile stuff. Just as we're getting stuff ready, I feel a tap on my shoulder. And the tap on my shoulder is my consultant colleague. But really quickly, first, first vote. Who would have put in a trauma drain for this patient? on the basis of what we had so far? Quite a lot of folk, okay? Anybody wouldn't have put in a trauma drain? Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you why. You're, you're safe from that kind of humiliation. Okay, cool. So I was absolutely of the mind that this needed a trauma drain. This tap on my shoulder. And it's a TNO consultant who says, Chris, you probably want to know, and I don't know if it makes a difference, but it looks like there's a transection of the aorta at the arch. And I'm in a situation now where we're about to put in this chest drain. There's no 
pneumothorax. And I'm not sure what the right thing to do is. I really don't know. I don't know if you put in a chest drain if that's not really a haemothorax or it's a haemothorax secondary to blood from the aorta. Because nobody really knows the answer to that question because it's not like something we study a lot and we do experiments on. So I've got the TNO consultants giving me the information. But I've got my anaesthetic consultant colleague, I've got my ITU colleague, and I've got my registrar who's very senior. And we have a conversation. And we have a conversation, and in that conversation, we decide that at this moment in time, we are not going to put a chest strain in because we don't understand what physiologically that's going to do to him, and it might actually make things worse. So we settle on that. And we then spend the next hour and a bit, well, less than that, it's probably about 40 minutes prepping him, getting all the rest of the consultants and getting the theatre ready. And we decided to do, we did things like we ran with a map of 55 to 60 because we figured he would be okay for that period of time with that. And then we got him to theatre. And I was thinking afterwards, um, I was thinking it was good. I reflect on the good stuff. I think what makes the good stuff good? And I think what made it good for me was that it was about us, not me. And I think what made it good for me was that I had people who were prepared to talk to me, to tap me on the shoulder, to say, this is a piece of inf information that might be useful to you. I don't know if it is or isn't, but it might be useful to you. You should probably have this. And then I had people around me who, would be, who were prepared to have an open conversation where we knew that none of us knew the actual answer. And that just made me think about it, made me think about this is good enough to get this guy all the way to theater. And just guys, so you know the clicker's not working, or at least it doesn't appear to be working. Um, shall I? Yeah. Yes. So I've worked in this hospital for 10 years. And this is one of the consultant trauma surgeons, trauma and orthopedics. So once you know people, if you can, if once you know people, they will talk to you. And we got this kid to theater, which I thought was pretty impressive given his injuries. So healthcare is a team business. We deliver it in complicated and sometimes complex environments. We do it with varying outcomes. And for 10 years, up until two years ago, as well as being an emergency medicine consultant, I was a governance lead. And I was investigating and trying to find out what happened when things went wrong. And if you'd come to me 10 years ago and you said, Chris, what do you think the answer is? I'd have been completely clear. I would have said the answer is process. If only people did what they're meant to do, what's written down. But once you start to investigate these things, once you start to investigate, once you start to find the people who are there with the supposedly smoking gun, you discover that the people that are involved in these incidents are often good, hardworking, highly knowledgeable, frequently very kind individuals. And yet here they are at the end of something that's happened with sometimes terrible results. And I realized that I must be missing something because these are the good guys. And it took me a while, but what I think I was missing is this, that process, process is written down on paper. But practice, practice happens between you and me, and it happens in an environment. And I simply didn't respect that as much as I should have done. So now if people ask me and say, Chris, what do you think the issue is and the answer? Well, I still think the process is important. We should be able to tell each other how we would do something on a perfect day with a following wind. But something else is more important, and that's people and how we treat each other. And I think the evidence will bear me out. But for clarity, I'm not standing here in front of you guys today to talk about the avoidance of error. If we wanted to avoid error, we could do that really simply. 
Because every morning when we woke up, if the most important thing in our lives was to avoid error, we could simply waken up, feel a bit crap, pull the duvet back over our head, phone into work and say, I'm not coming. Because if you don't go to work, you avoid error. But you don't, do you? You get up. You get up and you go to work knowing that your actions could result in something terrible happening to somebody, but that your intent is good. And what you're actually looking for is excellence. What you go to work to try to achieve is the best you possibly can in the circumstances. And that's what this talk is about. So I've already mentioned very briefly about complexity. And I want to run you through the most reductionist graph of complexity that I can manage that I think still makes some degree of sense. And I want to run you through it because if we get our heads around complexity, then I think it opens a whole bunch of doors to changing our thinking about who we are at work and how we achieve what we're trying to achieve. So along the bottom, we've got certainty about solution to the problem and it's going in the wrong direction. I know that high certainty to low certainty. Really quickly, I'm going to go through this. This, this, is, a, this is a bastardization of a graph by a guy called David Rook. And he's a super smart guy. Um, I have a more, a more full version of it that I can share with anybody who wants it. Simple puzzles, two plus two. We agree what the problem is, and we agree what the solution is. Hard puzzle. Sudoku. I don't know how to do Sudoku. Somebody would need to teach me. Then I know there's easy ones and fiendishly difficult ones. Complicated. Everything changes at complicated. Complicated's an operation, it's a trauma, it's a cardiac arrest, it's anything that requires more than one person to do it, really. Because in complicated situations, we all need to be working together towards a shared goal. And you might have the skills to do every single thing in the room, but that doesn't matter. Because they need to happen simultaneously, which means we need to rely on other people, which means we need to work together. And what I see as a problem in a given situation might not be what you see as a problem. And my solution to a problem that we both see might not be the same as your solution. Because we have different skill sets. But we're all going in the same direction. Shared goal. And then there's complex. Classic example of complex outside healthcare, Syria. Lots of different people think lots of different things are the problem. They have lots of different solutions. Some of them are diametrically opposed to each other. People pulling in other directions. But where do we get results in trauma? In trauma, we get our results in the complicated, in the complex, when we're working together. We get credibility in the simple puzzles and hard puzzles. And if you think about it, when you went to university, when you did your postgraduate exams, that was all about you knowing the answer. Because there was nobody sitting beside you in the exam. You didn't have a wee conf lab and work out what the right thing to say was. That was about you and your personal mastery. And we are wrapped up in personal mastery because it's easy to test. We are not so wrapped up in team mastery, which is a real shame because that's where we get our results. And a couple of things happen as we go up through this graph. The first one is fairly self-evident, that we have increasing teamwork. The second one's a wee bit different. So this is Shuli. Or it will be Shuli when I get it to click. There we go. That's Shuli. Um, I'm married to Shuli. Shuli is an emergency medicine consultant. She is senior to me. She is the clinical director of two acute medicine and emergency medicine departments. And I would like to tell you right here, right now, that I do not work in any of them because that would simply be too much. Now, surely super smart. And we share a lot in common, including children. And surely is Welsh. I'm Scottish. Very big difference. 
you'll appreciate that, I think. Um, Welsh, and she's Bangladeshi, and she's Muslim. And I'm Scottish, and I suppose the second bit Scottish, and a lapsed Protestant. Yeah? So we see the world through different eyes, although we have a lot in common. And we used to say that if you want to see the world through somebody else's eyes, you need to imagine it from their perspective. And this is what happens. So Chris sees problems. Squat, middle-aged, Scottish man, looks at problem things. Aha, I see problem. Now, how does Shuli see it? And I swing my lens around and I look at it from this angle and I go, well, I never. That's how Shuli sees it. That's fascinating. Only it's not. There's been some really elegant psychology experiments on this, that if you imagine what you think somebody else sees something like, it's better than nothing, but that is about all. Because when I swung my lens around, I did that with every single one of my unconscious biases still in play. And because they're unconscious, even after all my unconscious bias training, because they're unconscious, I don't know about them. So if we want to know what other people think when we're working in these teams, there are, there's one thing we need to do in advance, but there's two things we need to do at the time. And in advance, we need to create psychologically safe environments. But at the time, we have two things that we need to do. The first is that we need to ask other people what they think. And the second is that we need to give them time to answer and we need to listen to them. And that sounds so obvious, but when we work in a time pressured environment, that's actually a big ask, but it's hugely important. And what this means is that as we're going along and we have this increasing teamwork, as we listen to other people, things change. We get more information because our brains aren't big enough for us to take in all the information that we should have to make these difficult decisions, even about whether or not to put in a chest drain. We listen to other people, we take their advice on board, and then we change what our answer is going to be. And you never got marks in your exams for taking other people's opinion on board and then compromising with that. And the bottom line to this is that in complicated and complex situations, how much information we share is directly proportional to the quality of decision that we make. Now you can think about this, and I'm going to really quickly show you a model for this. You can think about this in a slightly different way, which is as the pool of information, a big empty swimming pool. There it is. And as you approach it, you've got what you know, which is some water in the bottom. You've got a choice. You can decide as the leader who is allowed to give information to your pool of information. So you invite people. You can make an easy choice. You can choose a whole bunch of people who think and look just like you. That'll be quite comfortable. You'll agree very quickly. Your decision making will be shit. Just up front, it will be crap decision making, or at least worse than it could be. If, on the other hand, you choose a bunch of people who don't think like you, who don't have the same priorities as you, who see the world through a different lens, and the easiest way of getting that is to get a whole bunch of people who don't look like you around a table, then if you get those people around and you get them to share information, then the quality of your decision making goes up. It's not enough to have them round the, round the table though, or round the pool. They've each got a tap and they choose to turn it on or turn it off. And the rest of this is going to be about how we turn the tap on or off. So really quickly, we know that we work in teams. There are lots of different things that help teams to perform at their best. We can think about hydration, we can think about um, sleep, we can think about eating. We now know that when people are 1% to 3% dehydrated, that the quality of their executive decision making can drop between 10 and 20%. That's a hell of a drop off. And of course, 
your body's keeping all the essential functions going. It doesn't really think that your higher logical functions are that essential. From your body's perspective, this is all about your kidneys, your heart, and a wee bit of your brain. <clears throat> we know that we need sleep. If we don't get sleep, we make faster, riskier decisions. And pretty much everybody knows somebody who, when they've not had something to eat, are perhaps not quite the best version of themselves. But there's other stuff that we can look at. I mean, that's just about the physiology of the individuals. So there's lots of different ways to think about this, but really briefly, there's a thing about whether you work in a real team or a pseudo team. There's a guy called Michael West researches this. And 98% of people in the NHS, where I come from, believe we work in teams. But only 40% of us work in real teams. The rest work in pseudo teams. And what's the difference? Real teams are codependent and they share goals. And the sharing of goals is the really important bit here. Pseudo teams, less codependent, but they don't share goals. They're going in different directions. And the problem with people going in different directions is this. Well, firstly, real teams perform at greater than the sum, greater than the sum of their parts. Pseudo teams don't. If you're going in different directions, but you believe that you're in a team and you don't know that the other people are going in a different direction, that gap between these two different directions, that gap manifests itself as tension, sometimes hostility, sometimes as really crappy behaviours between each other. And what happens then is that when you're pulling in different directions, because you don't share the mental model, you're pulling in different directions, you believe those other people are just being difficult, being bad. You believe that they're bad people. You start chucking crap at each other. You lose motivation in both sides and you expend energy that could be going into patient care fighting with each other. And what Michael West's work can show us is that within the NHS, where I come from, if we could take the percentage of people in real teams from 40% to 65%, that we would save between three and 12,000 lives a year. And the reason we'd save it is because we get all that effort that was going into that bit into fighting, it goes in towards looking after patients rather than hostility. And also we get the increased motivation for teams. But within healthcare, there is, there really wasn't any evidence on this. Within healthcare, we weren't at a stage where we really knew what, what happened if you did a randomized controlled trial on this until 2015. And in 2015, Riskin and Ayers did the first of their landmark studies. And what they did was they took teams of neonatal doctors and nurses and put them through a neonatal peri-arrest simulation. In fact, they put them through loads of them. And this is what they found. They found that the variation of performance went from the catastrophic to the absolutely amazing. And one factor was responsible for a huge amount of the variation here. And that's information sharing. How much did the teams tell each other? And in fact, what they found was that when teams treated each other poorly or were treated poorly from the outside, and that's important too, there was a 40 to 60% of the variance in information sharing could be explained by that one factor alone. When we treated each other well, when teams treat each other well, they share more information. When they treat each other poorly, they choose not to. And that translates into an 11% variance in, in survival. So that is us straight back to this pool of information. That is us straight back to this idea that we want people to be turning on their tap of information. What it boils down to is this. How we choose to treat each other is the single most important factor determining how well competent teams perform that we know of at the moment. As long as they've got the right tools, obviously. And how we treat each other can actually drive competent teams into incompetence. 
and how you've been treated will have driven you at points in your career, I can almost guarantee it, from being perfectly competent to do something to being somebody who couldn't do the job that you were asked to do. And that rudeness is called incivility. But if it's such a big deal, how come I went to Edinburgh Medical School in the 1980s and nobody ever mentioned it? In fact, Edinburgh Medical School in the 1980s was like many other medical schools in the 1980s. It was like a dirty, great Victorian incivility factory. We manufactured incivility and arrogance on industrial scales. And then you will be very pleased to know that we exported it, but mainly to England. <laughs> then I did my membership in surgery and I did my membership in emergency medicine. Nobody ever mentioned how we treated each other. And I did my fellowship in emergency medicine and not once did anybody talk to me about the importance of how we treat each other at work. And there's a reason for that. This is new science. Between 1996 and 2001, in the whole of academia, there were 23 papers on the impact of behaviour on performance. Between 2011 and 2016, there were 1,700. And they pretty much all say the same thing. That this stuff counts. I should check. I have no idea. Here in Denmark, have you guys ever seen rudeness at work? Maybe to you, maybe to somebody near you. Maybe it was by you. It's certainly been by me far too many times. I want you to think for a second. When somebody was rude to you, how did it feel? Because my guess is that when somebody was rude to you, for quite a few of you, when you think about how did it feel, you felt angry, pissed off. But the evidence is that in the moment, that's not what you feel. You get there, you get to anger. Sometimes it takes seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, even years. And you get to a place where you turn around and you say, how dare you, when all I was trying to do was my very best with the information I had at hand at that moment in time, how dare you come in and treat me like, like that? But in the moment when people treat us poorly, we feel belittled, ashamed, humiliated. We feel powerless and we feel childlike. But then we make sense of it. And how do you respond to the rudeness? Do we have any emergency medicine or orthopaedic guys in the room? So don't worry, you're not going to get asked questions. Okay, right, it's cool. It's just, in, just in case anybody doesn't understand the next slide, you're the man, all right? So how do they respond to rudeness? Over 90% of us want to get even. <laughs> That's your man, if you don't get to understand this, you know. But hidden within that 90%, there's something else. Turns out that most people want to get even, but if they see the person that has been rude to them as being representative of an organization or a group of people, over 80% of people are happy to get even with somebody else who represents that organization. What this means is you get some individuals who walk through life creating fucking carnage, and behind them, there's you. You copying all the crap from people who are pissed off with them. They're taken out on you. And if we allow these people to flourish in our organisations, allow those behaviours to flourish, because it's not the people, it's the behaviour. If we let that flourish in our organisations, we create a really awful environment for other people to work in. By the way, I don't believe they're bad people. I just believe they don't understand the impact of their behaviour. So this isn't about them being bad people. This is about how we help people to know the impact of behaviour. So there are four distinct groups of people who are impacted by rudeness. I'm going to talk about two of them really quickly. Impact on the recipient. So in the moment when somebody treats somebody else poorly, and I'm not talking about screaming and shouting here, I'm talking about the gentle or the end of stuff, the eye rolling in a meeting. 
somebody correcting your language halfway through a sentence, somebody just making slightly belittling comments. In the moment, that results in a 61% reduction in cognitive ability. And that lasts for a variable length of time. But this is the reason why if you go through a day and somebody's rude to you at the beginning of it, and then you get past it, but then every so often you find yourself thinking about it, what the hell was that about? You know, why did they say that? And then you go through the rest of your day and you occasionally think about it and you occasionally think about it. And then you finish your day and you get in the car or on your bike around here, I guess. And you are going home and you stop at the lights and you've got two minutes. And you're waiting at the lights, you've got a couple of minutes and your, your bandwidth opens out. Because this is all about our bandwidth. Your bandwidth opens out and you have that moment when you go, Oh, boom. If I'd said that right there, right then, they would have known just how smart I am. They would never come back to me and talk to me like that again. And I didn't say it. And then you're kicking yourself. You're kicking yourself for not being smart enough. But the truth is that in the moment, in the moment when this happens to us, you're not the wonderful, smart, witty people that you are right now when you're feeling relatively safe and your brains are open and your working memory is wide. In the moment, when people treat you poorly, squeezes down your working memory, your ability to be creative, to think of a good answer, plummets. So you're not that person at that moment in time. And this has, this has one thing that's worth touching on for a second, and that is, if it's important for us, people in this room, to be the smartest people, the smartest people in a room, we can create that. We can create that being the smartest person in the room thing by just being a bit belittling, rolling our eyes at folk, tutting, just being a bit dismissive. If we do that to enough people in the room, what happens is that they close down and we will be the smartest people in the room. Good for my ego, not good for my colleagues, not good for patient care. And I think we all know people who do it. I don't think they do it deliberately. I think they've been taught it. What about the impact on staff onlookers? Well, there's a ton in, on this now, but what we now know is we used to think there was no evidence that, that had an impact on staff onlookers, although it feels crap to be near people who are having a, an altercation. You can measure it. It's a 20% reduction in your ability to think. And if you think, if you think about it, two people having an interaction, all these people around them, 20% reduction for each of them, that's an awful lot of percentages coming out of your team right there. But it doesn't stop there, because if somebody's exposed to rudeness, they get up and they walk around the corner and somebody asks them for help, they're a full 50% less likely to help that person around the corner. But there's one group of people who are more likely to be rude or uncivil than anybody else. And that is bosses or people in authority. And they don't, start, they don't start off like that. This is something that happens to us when we move into authority to a lot of people. Paul Pith, Dacher Keltner, a bunch of other people look at this. You become a boss, you're three times more likely to sit in a meeting on your computer for something other than that meeting. You're three times more likely to interrupt people and you're three times more likely to raise your voice at them. The good news is that the research on wisdom says that the wise ones don't stay like that. Wise leaders, wise bosses, move to a different place, which is ask, don't tell. And what they're doing is filling that pool of information. So let's pull it together. So it's 1959. It's the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh. The NHS that I work in is 11 years old at this time. And that is my mum. On my mum's left is Charlotte, on my mum's right is Julie. And some of you guys will have parents who, who were nurses and doctors, and they will have been utterly forged by the experience of being in healthcare. My mum and her pals certainly were, and I'm pretty certain that our kids will say the same thing about us in years to come. Forged in the fires of healthcare. Back in 1959, 1959 twice a day, it was my mum's job to clean the ash trees, one of which was built into every single bedside cabinet. The doctors used to say to the patients, do you smoke? Good for the nerves. 
and I like to think that my mum would follow behind them and say, do you smoke? Would you like to try one? <laughs> she hates it when I say that. Um, and then what happened? We found out the terrible toll that tobacco takes on health. And we as healthcare professionals stopped smoking. And then the rest of society, with various other levers, gradually smoking became less and less common. So now it's 2021. We're beginning to understand the impact that behaviour can have on team performance in healthcare. And that's great. What a wonderful opportunity. Because by choosing to behave in ways that value and respect the people around us, we help them to perform at their personal peak. When people perform at their personal peak and we're working in teams, we have a chance that our teams are going to share information and perform at a collective peak. When our teams perform at a collective peak, we get better outcomes for patients and for staff. Or in other words, civility saves lives. Thanks very much for your time, guys.